Christians must choose forgiveness, to forgive as we've been forgiven. That's a hard process. Actually, God commands us to forgive. It's part of the process that says, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another even as God in Christ forgave you. It gives us the command that we should forgive. Not just be kind and friendly and caring, but to actually grant forgiveness. Matthew 18, 21 and 22 says, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 70 times seven. It's one thing to be required to forgive. It's another thing to know, how do I do forgiveness? How do I break the unforgiveness in my heart? Colossians 3 Uh, 13 and 14 says, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Quite honestly, I can forgive somebody stepping on my toe and even somebody who gets angry and yells at me. But there are elements when I say, this is seeming beyond forgiveness. See, those things are kind of like kindergarten forgiveness. I can forgive for those simple things. But lots of things are graduate level forgiveness. When I have to look at something deep, how do I forgive when it hurts so much, when it's much deeper than you can imagine? Bart Millard, and this is him pictured right here with his family. Bart Millard was, had his life changed virtually overnight. His dad was um, a flagman for the city, and while he was flagging down, a semi came and just hit him, drug him under the truck, and put him into a coma for eight weeks. Bub, that's what they called him, his dad, Bub was there and virtually incoherent. But fortunately, even though he was brain damaged, he came out of that coma after eight weeks, But he was a changed man, and not for the better. Things were difficult for him. The slightest provocation would set him off, and he would go into tirade. And it wasn't just a verbal tirade. It would explode into physical violence. So much so that his wife, Adeline, he actually destroyed everything that she owned at one time, just going through in this destructive terror. After that happening multiple times, She couldn't handle it anymore, and she packed her bags and left. And and she left her two kids with the dad. On the outside, people saw this divorce and thought, "How how could she respond like that? How could she abandon them, not realizing how the accident had affected him and, and what it left for him? So at third grade, Bart was by himself with his dad and his brother, he was virtually no, no mother, and so much of the outside world didn't understand what was going on. When she left, um, dad started turning his anger toward Bart. Harsh spankings, yelling, tearing him down, and then finally, he would beat him three or four times a week, unmercifully. And it wouldn't have anything to do with what Bart had done necessarily. It could be anything that would set him off. It could be that somebody pulled in front of him in traffic earlier that day. Or that the Cowboys didn't win. Or whatever took place that caused him anger and he would take it out on Bart. Bart had received, in spite of this, uh, a certification for honors. And he was going to be recognized uh, for his honors degree in class. And they sent a note home with him for his parents so that they could be at this uh, occasion. Bart forged his dad's signature and went back to say that he wasn't going to attend. Unfortunately, the teacher talked to Bob and told him about the note, and that set him in a tirade that had been worse than any before. He started with a razor strap and started beating him and then changed to a paddle and beat him more. So much so that for, he couldn't go to school for the next two days. He was basically, he couldn't put clothes on. It was so painful for him. And, and those kinds of events happened again and again and again. But, 
the wounds were deeper than the outside physical. It was a boy who was lonely and needed his dad and needed encouragement. And he went to church to try to find some solace. And when he went there, he heard the message that he must forgive. And in his mind, he thought, how could I ever forgive that? I'll come back to the story. A pastor friend of mine shared about the process of forgiveness and how he'd preached hundreds of sermons on forgiveness throughout his ministry. And it was all something that he had completely down in his mind, how it would work and what the prospect was and theologically the details of it until his daughter was raped. He said everything went out the window. The anger that had built up inside, the pain that it caused him, the rehearsal of the pain that his daughter had gone through, how can I ever forgive that? In my heart, he said, I answered, it's humanly impossible. And the truth is there are some things that are humanly impossible to forgive. That is, the human heart can't find the funds to bounce the, I mean, to write the check to say, I forgive you, because it would bounce each time because there's not enough love inside our hearts on our own. How can we be reconciled to something like that? Forgiveness comes from God. It's a gift from Him. His command is be reconciled. Colossians 3 says, just as the Lord forgave you, also should you forgive. Just as the Lord has forgiven you. You know, the source is to come back to the forgiveness that we've received from God. The source of our forgiveness to others is coming back to the forgiveness that we've received from God. In the Bible, a story is told of a king settling accounts and how that works for that king as he sets up and calls one after the other. In fact, Jesus told the story of this settling of accounts and what happens is the man had such a great debt that he would have to sell everything he owned, give his family, all his possessions, and in perpetuity work for uh, the man who he owed because he could never pay back the debt. Understanding the parables of Jesus, um, J. Perry says, in Jesus' day, it's estimated that the 10,000 talents owed equaled 100 million denarii. One, day, one denarii was a typical day's wage for a common laborer. If you put that together, today it would be an estimated cost of about $3 billion. Biola University ended up saying that would take then 200,000 years to basically equate. And this man begged for time. Did you catch that? 200,000 years to, to pay it off. And he said, could I just have a little more time? Matthew 18, it says, And the Lord of the slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him. He forgave him. This huge debt. And the issue of the story was, the slave didn't live forgiven. That, that's the point. He didn't experience the great forgiveness that came to him to the fact that he could extend it to others. He didn't understand how much he'd been forgiven. It didn't... It didn't register in his heart. Matthew 18, 33 says, Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the way that I had mercy on you? In other words, just as you've received mercy, you should have given mercy. And that's why he received the penalty that he did. It's carried through in another story when Jesus um, comes, talks about this woman who comes and pours out her life for, for Jesus to give thanks and opens up this pure nard and pours it on his feet and wipes it with his hair. And they're saying, wow, this is not, this is criminal. Don't you understand who she is and what she's done? And Luke 7 says in verse 47, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. If you've for been forgiven a lot, you love a lot. If you've been forgiven a lot and recognize that you're able to forgive others a lot. Do I even understand the huge debt that I've been forgiven? See, that's the source, is to come back and say, do I recognize 
how much I've been forgiven? Or am I like that slave who just writes it off and says, oh, well, you know, glad that happened and then go on with my life. But once I understand the forgiveness that's touched me, then I have the ability to forgive others. It's drawn from the forgiveness. See, I can see my sin's effect on Jesus and how he absorbed it, and I can either live in gratitude of that forgiveness or I can live in gratitude. If you read it on the, on the screen, I think you'll catch what I just said. Right? You either live gratefully for the forgiveness and it overflows to everybody that's around you, or you live not recognizing what's happened to you and you're not grateful in your experience. We live out of the sense that we've been forgiven. That is, that our sin has been buried and we raised to a new life, and there's joy in that forgiveness. And there's power in that forgiveness to extend to others. Forgiveness, though, is a choice. I don't forgive people because I'm weak. I forgive them because I'm strong enough to know people make mistakes. How do I forgive such a deep hurt? Some of us study grudgeology, the art of holding the grudge, because I think that by holding that grudge, I have power over somebody else. That somehow my keeping this record against me of the wrong gives me an opportunity to hold them hostage. And maybe you're holding on to the grudge, the unforgiveness, the anger, the hurt from the past as a way to pay back the person who's harmed you, at least subconsciously. Hey, Pudger, they said to her, where did you get that shirt? The tent and awning store? She says it rehearses in my mind ongoingly the effect of those kids teasing me, they may have thought it was just a joke about my clothes, but it was about me, and it turned to affect my whole perception of myself. How could I ever forgive somebody who's so unkind? She's a 20-year-old piece of eye candy on his arm, and he dangles her around in front of me after the divorce, and she's the one who's caused it, and he parades her around like a prize. How can I ever not just forgive him, but forgive her? It's hard to forgive, not just somebody else, but somebody who's hurt my son, the drug dealer on the corner who drew him in just for his own funds and hooked him and changed his whole life. How could I ever forgive somebody who hurt my kid? Maybe I'll never feel forgiveness. Never feel forgiveness toward them because my heart cannot keep from being repulsed by their actions. But even though I can't feel it, I can choose it. Even though I can't feel it, I can choose it. I can choose to forgive in the same way I can choose to love even my enemy. The love that I have to pass along to this enemy of mine comes from God. He's the true source of love. I make a choice to do what God declares is right above what I feel. Isn't that an ongoing choice? To crucify self and what we feel and how we experience it and choose to connect with God and let him work through me? Sometimes I cling to the grudge, rehearsing it as if by doing so, I pay them back for their wickedness, afraid that if I let go, I'm somehow validating their sin. Forgiveness is not excusing or condoning their actions. It will always be wrong to steal, backbite, commit adultery, rape, have drug addiction. They're always wrong. Forgiveness is not some sort of holy amnesia of forgetting. We sometimes act as if we're supposed to skip and no longer remember the past. But that's really not reality, is it? We can forgive to the place that even though we rehearse it, we don't hold them accountable any longer for the pain. That's distinct. Doesn't mean that somehow, oh, I become a Christian and I don't remember any of those beatings anymore. That's not how it works. Forgiveness is not giving unearned trust. It doesn't mean that suddenly I, I, have, I have this ability to trust them completely. I don't take the person who's stolen my money and give them more money to... to um, use for that. I don't necessarily immediately excuse somebody who's cheated on me. I might ask for 
evidence. I might ask for their phone so I can um, ping it to know where they're at. I might ask for um, confirmation of where they've been. That doesn't mean I haven't forgiven them. Sometimes we have to recognize that they have to earn trust back, and trust is an earned process, and that we can release and open a bit at a time and reestablish that trust. Forgiveness doesn't mean automatic trust in the same way. Forgiveness doesn't mean that I've removed the consequences of the sin. Forgiveness doesn't mean I've removed the consequences of the sin. The drunken driver who ran over the child's bike still needs to repair the bike and pay for the hospital bills and will need to work his steps in the court-mandated treatment program. Just because I've forgiven them doesn't mean that there isn't some consequences because sometimes those consequences will help move them back in the right direction. Helping them in their growth toward the kingdom becomes our motivation, not exacting our pound of flesh. We say sometimes people need to suffer the consequences of their actions in order to recognize why God gave them the command not to to begin with. In looking at that whole process, Proverbs 19.19 19 says, a man of great anger will bear the penalty, for if you rescue him, you will only have to do it again. If you free him from the consequences, there's that opportunity to repeat and repeat and repeat. Somebody who enables their child to go through and commit abuse and, and saves them every time from the consequences ends up giving them the opportunity to repeat the offense. Now, it is true. Sometimes God steps in and reverses the process. There are times when God doesn't give us the consequences of our sin, not only eternally, but immediately. He does sometimes step in and uh, restore the years that the locusts have taken and, and, and praise God for that. But that's not always how he works. Sometimes he lets us suffer the consequences. There are times when he says, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. But it doesn't mean he removes the consequences. For 40 years, Israel wandered in the wilderness as a consequence of their disobedience. He didn't spare them completely. David's son dies when David has um, murdered and committed adultery and covered, him, covered it up. David's son dies as a result of that. He doesn't always remove the consequences of sin. And today, the same thing could be true. Someone has, uh, someone has premarital sex and they have a child, the child doesn't automatically just disappear because everybody's forgiven and they've worked their way back to trust God. It doesn't work like that. Forgiveness is something that's a heart thing. Forgiveness is not then excusing or condoning the actions. Forgiveness is not some holy amnesia of forgetting. Forgiveness is not giving unearned trust. Forgiveness is not removing the consequences. It's a choice that I make. In the Greek, the first word of to forgive, uh, phime means to leave, to go away, to put aside, to abandon, to neglect. What it means is, I put away the debt. I no longer charge. I excuse the charge. I erase the debt that's against me. I choose to forgive. I commit to no longer rehearsing the grievance against another person. When I forgive, I choose to forgive. I commit to no longer rehearsing the grievance against the other person. In other words, I take it out of what they owe me. They no longer have an account that I'm registering in my heart. Jeremiah 31, 34 says, They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will know me from the least of them to the greatest, says, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. God does stop remembering. But again, that doesn't mean he has holy amnesia, that somehow for himself or for us. He doesn't come down to us and say, I'm going to remove those parts in your brain cell that rehearse, that have that picture in your mind. Instead, what he does is it's remembrance in the same way that he talked about in Exodus 2, 24, and God heard the groanings uh, and he remembered his covenant. He remembered not like, oh, oh, I knew there was something I was forgetting. He remembered like he acted on it. So when you say, They'll remember no more, that is, I'm no longer going to act on that debt that's owed me. I have, I have eradicated it. 
Not that I've forgotten that it was ever owed to me, but it's removed. It's no longer held for me. Colossians 3, 12 and 13, we read a little earlier, but I want to come back to it. So, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, would that be you? Would you count that as you? Put on a heart of compassion. Put on. It's a choice. Kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you, in essence, forgive them. It's a choice that we put on. It's a decision that we make. It doesn't just happen in marriages. It happens with siblings. It happens with parents and their children. It happens in churches. People decide that they've, they're done with this person. They won't forgive them. They won't give them opportunity to make it right. And there's nothing that you can do about that. You can only choose your response to people. The second word in Greek um, to forgive is charizomai. It's the same word that we get grace from. To grant pardon, to give graciously, to give freely, to bestow. It means, in essence, to give them grace. A promise of forgiveness has four elements that are here. This is what I'm saying in a promise. I went through and said what promises aren't, what that forgiveness isn't. When I give a promise of forgiveness, this is what it means. One, I release you from the debt you owe me. He did not wait for us to confess. Jesus forgave us while we were enemies toward him. He didn't wait for us to make it up. He didn't make for us to come and ask for forgiveness. He granted it to us while we were still sinners, while we were enemies of God. Remember, Jesus says, just as I forgave you, in the same manner, you should forgive others. Before they ask, no matter how sorry they demonstrate. Now, they can only receive that forgiveness. They can only benefit from it when they accept forgiveness and deal with it themselves. That's how they receive it. But that's not your part. That's not how I have to work. I have to work by saying, I'm going to extend the, the forgiveness and keep no record of wrongs. That means I wipe out that debt. How can you forgive somebody over and over again? The question is, it really doesn't matter how many times if you forgive the first time. Because it's been wiped out. So there, in one way you could say, you just have to forgive once every time it comes up. Because once you did, that thing's gone and you have a clean slate to start over with. Promise number one of forgiveness is, I release you from the debt you owe me. When you forgive, you don't change the past, but you do change the future. It doesn't erase what's gone on, but you no longer have a debt that you're carrying over for the future. Promise number two, I will not rehearse or bring up the incident. That is, it is actually buried, separated as far as the east from the west, buried into the depths of the sea, Scripture has it, because what's happened is I've removed it from us, and so I will not rehearse it anymore. It's gone. I've chosen that. Not that I can't bring it to mind and think of what it was, but the point is, is that it's now separated from you. It's not your debt. Promise number three, I will not talk to others about the incident. Why would I rehearse it and bring it over and over again for others to have to suffer through when it's already been taken off of the record? Right? It's quiet out there, right? Right? Thank you. I will, I will not talk to others. Jesus rode in the sand. And I think there was a reason why Jesus rode in the sand when there were all kinds of people that were there that needed forgiveness. There were those that were there who were part of bringing that woman into adultery. There were those there who had a long record in history of the past. But you know, Jesus didn't call out and list all of the things that they were doing. Instead, he rode on the sand in order to, in order to save them, to give them opportunity to repent and be drawn back to him. Promise number four, I will not let the incident stand between us and hinder our relationship. 
I will not let the incident stand between us and hinder our relationship. Oh, that doesn't change the things we just talked about. That doesn't mean that suddenly I will, uh, I, uh, doesn't mean suddenly I will trust you with my car if you got drunk and, and went and wrecked it. It doesn't mean I would take you, I will take you to a place and allow you to the money at the bar and drop you off at the bar if you've been an alcoholic. But what it does mean is that in this relationship, I will look for the best for you, not just for me. Part of recognizing somebody's failings and weaknesses is to help protect that weakness. Forgiveness doesn't change that I'm looking to protect the other's weakness. That's why I talked about some, some of the suffering, the consequences, is to help protect the other's weakness. Having boundaries that say, I'm not going to do this with you because it's going to draw you into that weakness, that's protecting another's weakness. So part of my goal is to say, I've forgiven you to the place that I know you enough through this process that I want to protect your weakness. Say amen. The prodigal son, what Jesus does is it gives that story of bringing the prodigal back and welcoming and bringing him in. And yes, he meets him halfway, but did you notice that he didn't go after him outside of that realm? He waited till the son was ready to repent. But although the son's whole hope was just gaining money, the father wanted him back in relationship. And he receives that and he goes through punishment from the community in order to do that. Sometime we'll rehearse the prodigal a little more. Forgiveness has no limits. Matthew 18, 21, Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? How long do I continue to forgive him until I write him off? In other words, that's what he's saying. Paraphrase, at what point do I say enough is enough? And Peter was actually being super generous. The Pharisees said twice, and then because they counted themselves very pious, they added an di additional time, three. And Peter says, three plus three plus one, seven. The perfect number of forgiveness. Is that enough? Up to seven times? Jesus responds 70 times seven. In other words, without end. The complete number of forgiveness and remember that the point is, if you forgive once and truly forgive, then you start over. Matthew 18, 22, Jesus said to him, I do not say up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. How many times have we been forgiven? If he says, forgive like I've forgiven you, at what point would Jesus say, sorry, that's enough? You've Send away your day of grace. Now, it's true that Jesus allows us to continue in relationship or step back and say, I don't want any more to do with you. And he allows us to do that. But from his side, he's done everything. He's already paid for every sin that you'll ever commit. He's already paid for every sin that you'll ever commit. Which means there's no end. From his side, he's already paid it all. Whether we live in that forgiveness is our choice. What Jesus is saying is there are no throwaway people. There are no people that you say, sorry, they're too horrible to save. They're too horrible for me to extend God's love to. I left the story with Bart Millard coming to the point that he, he was working through that Christian question brought to him at church, how do I forgive someone like my dad for what he's done to me, for what he didn't do that he should have done? He decides to pull away and live his own life separated from his dad, and what he does is he gets into church and to ministry, and he he works with a little-known group called Mercy Me and forms a band, and they begin to sing gospel music and go from place to place and singing songs about Jesus and God's love. And someplace along the way, as they're repeating songs, he realizes in his own heart how superficial it is 
from what's going on inside of him, and he breaks down. He starts wondering what he's, what's going on for him, and then he's told in that virtually same time that his dad is struggling. He decides to go home to confront his dad, to work out this past. He knew that he needed to make things right with his father who was dying from prostate cancer, and he comes home and he talks to his dad and he lays it all out, and his dad breaks down and tells him that he's been trying to go to church and find forgiveness for himself. And he begins witnessing to his dad, and they begin to study God's Word. And his dad weeps over what he's done to his son in the past and how it scarred his son. And over and over again, he, he apologizes. And, and Bart really sees a change in his dad. To the place that Bart said, he claims that he's become the most godly man he ever knew. Bart's dad does die in that time frame, and, and shortly after his funeral, he wrote a song about imagining being with his dad eternally. And the song is, I Can Only Imagine. He went through and tells the story of what it will be like to reunite. Now imagine, imagine the difference in the story if Bart had never forgiven Imagine what it would do to Bart and what it would do to his dad. If you can imagine, I can never imagine what it would be like to get there and say, wow, <clears throat> this person is here who I never would forgive. Maybe somebody else showed them God's love through forgiveness. Maybe somebody else reached out and touched them. That song, I only can imagine, I'll uh, let you work through in your mind and have the words, we want to give you an opportunity to respond to the love of God um, as we talk about His love for us. Forgiven, I repeat, I've been forgiven. And free before the Master, I now stand. Forgiven, I can help but forgive my brother. Forgiven, I reach out to take your hand. Let's stand together as we sing, I'm loved.